Sorry, my cold has actually gotten a little worse since I, we recorded this episode. But uh, yeah, Jose and I had a kind of a cold um, on this one. This is a news-only episode, one zero three. We talked about news. We talked about uh, what we've been working on for the for the pop, for the website uh, CliveBarkerCast dot com, and we talked about um the uh, update for the upcoming Kickstarter project so um, which is really exciting we can't wait to unveil that so and we're very very close uh, so anyway here we go episode 103 so uh, how is it going with you guys well it's going well uh going pretty good with me having a good week so far except for having a small uh, uh, sore throat yeah. Uh, Doing good, doing good. A lot of news to talk about uh, yeah, for yeah. Parker fans today. Yeah, I guess we should just jump right in. Um, so, uh, since our news episodes are about once a month, so uh, we, you know, they, they kind of build up. So this one goes back all the way to August. But uh, there's going to be a Nightbreed Director's Cut screening in the Kanazawa Film Fest in uh, September 22nd, and that's just on a few days. Yeah, and that's in Coming Japan. Up. Hey, yeah. you've been to Japan, Ryan. Oh, yeah. Yep. So that's cool. Uh, Kanazawa Film Fest. Are you familiar with where it's going to be, like the area? No, not really. Uh-uh. Okay. Um, I knew Kobe and Osaka and Kyoto are the places that I've been to. Oh, right, right. That's cool. I, I hear Hellraiser is really... Uh, Hellraiser was really uh, popular in Japan, so Nightbreed, I'm sure it'll also be very popular there. Yeah, yeah. I wonder they, if it'll be subtitled or how they're going to do it. Because I think the the director's cut doesn't have Japanese subtitles, right? I think it just has um, like French and Spanish or something. Hmm, something like that, I guess. I didn't yeah. use them. That's a good point. Uh, uh, I don't know that <clears throat> was not brought up in the report, but. Uh, I'm sure uh, they'll probably have some kind of track. Yeah, well, or you know, and also my experience in Japan was that anybody born after World War II spoke pretty well, pretty good English, and ah. it was just the people born before World War II that didn't speak English. Which by this time, you know, that was 20 years ago. So by this time, probably a lot of those people aren't around anymore. Sure. Yeah, probably it's going to be just in English, and people are going to understand it. So. Yeah, that's what I would think. Um, and. It kind of related uh, Philip O'Neill, right? Yeah, Jose, you wrote you wrote up wrote about this one that he's he's putting together a fan cut that's sort mm-hmm. of like in between the the Cabal cut and the director's cut. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't post this on Occupy Midian yet because Philip told me, well, let's just give it a little more time. I don't want people to you know rush me before this is done. But he is he has been working on this. Um, I think he saw. The original theatrical Nightbreed a few years ago, and then he found out that uh, the, the the Cabal Cut was out there. I think he saw it in Germany when Russell Charrington screened it there. Yeah. And it really knocked his socks off, and he's been thinking about making his own version <laughs> ever since. Yeah. Uh, like a fan edit. You know, there's a big thing in the internet about fan edits. Um, it's a thing. <coughs> And, well, and, and, people... and there is a difference between the Cabal cut and the director's cut. I mean, there were some, some, um, you know, there were some editorial choices that made them, you know, pretty different, oh, yeah. different movies. Oh yeah, like 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 scenes that uh, Decker's talking to the mask that never made it to the director's cut. I guess yeah. Clive changed his mind about those things. But uh, and uh, Joyce, like novel. Joyce lived and helped um, and helped out. Uh, I bet in in yeah. the Cabal cut, and he died in the director's cut, just like in the theatrical version. Sure, and and uh, like I said, uh, I think on a previous episode, the Cabal cut has leaked on the internet. That's true. Yeah, like some guy from England was selling like bootleg a bootleg DVD of the Cabal cut. Yeah, must have been like either the yeah. sixth version or something like that. Yeah, uh, it might have been someone related to one of these screenings. I don't know. Maybe someone copied one of Russell's DVDs or something. Um, anyway, what matters is that this fell onto the internet on a torrent and some people have 
you know, downloaded it. And I don't think many people have actually reviewed the Cabal Cut yet, but I think that uh, Philippe and, you know, myself, we had a copy of the Cabal Cut, and uh, Philippe has been using that to intercut some parts of um, footage that have not been put into the director's cut into his own cut. I think he's doing a great job. I mean, he's been sending me updates and he's been talking about this with me. Uh, every once in a while, I get a message on Facebook and he's like, hey, I, I'm going to put this scene over here and I'm going to move that scene over there. What do you think? And I'm like, yeah, I think it'll work. So it's I know this is not uh, sanctioned, officially sanctioned by anybody, but he's been getting some good feedback hmm. even from people like like Hugh Ross and uh, and uh, Nicholas Vince and Simon wow. Bamford, I think. Well, I mean, he's not going to be correcting things that he thinks are mistakes in the original movie. I remember him posting yeah. stuff online about, like, was there was something about Boone's truck? He's like, oh, this isn't the same truck in this shot as it is in this <laughs> shot. Well, of course, you can't change that because you'd have to reshoot. You'd have to reshoot the scene with a different truck. Or cut stuff but, out. I mean, I don't know. Well, a fan edit does change things, and he's planning on cutting a few things out and putting a few things in. Um, yeah. So... I mean, just take it for what it is. It's a fan edit, and uh, I wonder if he'll uh, use the uh, alternate uh, scene between uh, Lori and Boone at the beginning instead of them at the apartment. There's another scene with him where Boone's kind of, you know, he I has think anxiety. So. I'm not sure. Decker. I like that scene a lot better. Yeah, better yeah. Scene. And there's also a scene where I think uh, Boone is coming out of a shower and he gets a call from uh, Decker, yeah. and. And he's talking to him. I don't remember. Did that make it into the director's cut? Yes, I, don't, it did, I think, so. yeah, that is in the director's cut. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. But then the yeah. extended scene of Boone in Decker's office is not there where he's like, he was crying and, and, and Decker was hugging him. Oh, okay. When when he thinks that uh, he's like, tell me I didn't do this or something. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. I don't know. I guess we'll wait and see. He plans on putting... When it's completed, he plans on putting this cut on Vimeo or some other website like that mm. so people can see it. Oh, I mean, really? Obviously, you know, this is not something that's going to be sold or anything because yeah. that's illegal. But, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, you know, we have the theatrical one. You know, if you're lucky enough to find the leaked Cabal cut, you can have the Cabal cut as well. We do have the Nightbreed's director cut um, that was, you know, made with Andrew Furtado, Mark Miller, and mm -hmm. Clyde Barker. So... Why not a fan edit? I mean, yeah. I wish there were more people working on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, even uh, even the you know even the cabal cut, I started to feel like they were cutting too much of out of it by the end. Oh sure. Yeah. I mean, saw, for, for my it. taste, I don't know. I mean, that's not to say that I think they did it wrong. I just think for the, what I liked was the first one I saw, and maybe yeah. it was getting all caught up in the hype and the start of Occupy Midian and and all of that and the excitement of all that, but. You know, I just I just really loved the first one, and I loved the sort of Holocaust feeling of the of the the battle yeah. at the end. You know, I'm jealous that you got to see that one. Yeah, because... no, you got to see the whole shebang. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, like it was three, it, over three hours, wasn't it? Yeah, it was pretty. It was kind of muddy, you know, and hard to. It was hard to make out what was going on, but but even luckier than that was the people who actually saw the the screening of the work print. Uh, the actual work print. Oh, at, at Horror Hound without, in 2009? Yeah, before Russell Charrington even got yeah. to make the Cabal Cut. Even well, though they said that some people were leaving the room because yeah, it, it was really rough. It had no yeah. sound also. Yeah, and, and there were like all those like uh, real leader-ins, like the, the ones that say like, you know, four, three, two, one, yeah, and then yeah. it cut to another scene, and that would be four, three, two, one, another scene. Yeah. So... So all that, that had been done, I think, is that Phil and Sarah took the videotapes and put them on a DVD for Mark, and then mm -hmm. he put the DVD, you know, then he screened that DVD. Yeah, and then, you know, Russell got a copy of the DVD, and then he got to work. That's how the yeah. could. But yeah. anyway, I mean, it, expect it to be different, because some scenes are going to be moved around inside the movie. Uh, other scenes maybe get cut. Other scenes yeah. from the Cabal Cut may get put in. So it'll be definitely a very, you know, uh, a, a little more extended, but at the same time it'll be reworked. So it's not – don't expect um, it to be very close to the director's cut or the, the cabal cut yeah. because it'll be like something that Philippe wants to do according to his ideas of, you know. It's like he wants to test his editing skills and see what he can come up with uh, 
and yeah. different I I, ways to edit the movie. Well, I, 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 I look forward to it personally, and yeah. I wish him, I wish yeah. him the best of luck, you know, with that. Well, and, and yeah, if sure. he, even if he if he does something and you you see it and you don't like it, it's like it doesn't take away the theatrical cut or the cabal cut or the director's cut. So those of course all, not. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it's just another way of experiencing the movie, and um, you know. Just it, keep an open mind and enjoy it. If it's kind of like it, when, when they made the Smurfs movie and this guy was like, oh, the, that's raping my childhood. It's like, well, you don't have to go watch it. <laughs> no. Yeah, but sure. <laughs> go right. watch your old cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> or people who claim George Lucas raped their childhood because yeah. he put Jar Jar Banks in there or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. This is different. This is just like a, an, an edit. An yeah. Edit. So um, yeah. at the same time, I'm, I'm really happy to see what he's doing. And there's even some stuff, I don't know if he wants me saying this but there's even some things that he's you know adding in like uh like different shots uh where he thinks that the shot was not very good mm. so <laughs> okay but, uh, yeah but <laughs> but there's you know it, it's just it's it's experimental it's experimental yeah. it's it's going to be interesting to see what he comes up with i'm yeah. really excited about it yeah i know well, some and, people and... are more purist and it's okay. They're probably going to be like, oh, I don't want to see anything else apart from Clyde Barker's, you know, director's cut. That's perfectly I, acceptable. I do feel that way, but I wouldn't judge his project until I see it, so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So Wasn't he going to write a script, too? <laughs> yes. He I'm wanted to sure. write his own Nightbreed script. Yeah, I think he was. I remember yeah. reading that on Occupy Midian. I think that was before he decided to do this. So oh, yeah. I think this this oh, will okay. be his uh, this <laughs> okay. will be his reinterpretation of the material. Yeah. I, think. Yeah. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. Well, maybe he was uh, doing maybe just a writing sample or something. Maybe the maybe he was interested in screenwriting. I was just curious. Sure, sure. I mean, why not? I mean, there's so many people who did uh, Nightbreed stories for uh, Midian Unmade. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Still haven't read that yet. I need to, but. Get to it sometime. Sure. I haven't either. I have it now, but yeah, I haven't read it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys are free to to read that and make some uh, reviews. I still have, I still have um, my own copy that I read, but I haven't written the review yet. Sorry, Dell. I know he was expecting that review uh, some time ago, but I, I just haven't been able to to work on that yet. Yeah. Well, and I've been my my reading has all been. Um, Everville, and even that, I'm just, I'm only like 140 pages in right now. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've read some chapters at the beginning, but I need to pick it up again. Yeah. Because we might do it like next, next episode or two episodes from now. So, yeah, that's a good idea. It's been at least 10 years since I've read that book, so it's good to get back into it. I, I've forgotten so much about it. Oh, yeah. that's, that's right. I also read it only once. So it's one of those Clyde Barker books that I never revisited. Yeah. Uh, so. so people will remember the Clive Barker Society. Uh, we talked about that a little before. It's kind of like a fan club, uh, but they send you cool. You, you pay a yearly fee, and they send you cool stuff. Uh, so the Clive Barker Society will be, um, and I think, and they did their welcome package already, right? That's what we got in the mail. Yes, yeah. that was um, the welcome package that with they a will T-shirt send to and a pin. Everyone, yeah. Standard or collector, they. They will all receive as first package the T-shirt, the pin, and the printed welcome yeah. from Clyde Barker. Then that, that that was pretty cool. Um, so they are going to be appearing at ShakaCon in Charleston, West Virginia, September 18th through the 20th. So as you're hearing this, it might be too late because we're recording this on the 17th. That I'm probably we're probably going to get this edited and up over the weekend. Mm, that's yeah, when it's going. it happens that. over the weekend. Yeah, yeah. So if you happen to hear this in time and you can get out there, I hope that you're not relying on us to find out about this. But Well, uh, Rob posted this on August 24, plenty of time to spare. So yeah, if you've been yeah. following our blog, you might have already known about this. Yeah. So I hope and you have your and, tickets ready. And we encourage everybody to, uh, to, to read our blog because we've been really, you know, since Rob came on, we've really stepped it up. As far as keeping up with the Clive Barker news, so <laughs> yeah, and uh, the content too is uh, also go read uh, stuff. Uh, all the you know Ron and uh, Jose and I write up on like new and you know Tuesday tunes and stuff like that. Those yeah, are, um, yeah, we've got a lot of we we try to do a lot of fun features also. That's right. 
Um, so Century Guild decided not to go to Comic Con anymore. Uh, I think this was their their la- this 2015 Comic Con was their last one, um, and I'm not sure it <clears throat> how that affects Clive Barker's stuff. I guess it would probably for the um, Imaginer book because I think they unveiled that at Comic Con the first one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess. Showing and, off his artwork. The yeah, artwork. but I think that you know, in a that that's only one. That's one side of Clive Barker's stuff. But yeah. uh, but Mark Miller is probably going to continue to go to Comic Con, you know, for for Clive Barker's related Seraphim. stuff and his own comic books and things. Oh yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. Seraphin. I mean, this is Century Guild's presence. I don't know yeah. if that correlates to uh, Seraphin not being it. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I no, think I, I think it only has to do with the stuff that Century Guild is involved in, and there's there's crossover for sure. But sure, but uh, yeah, pro- I mean it. It would be hard to go to that. I mean, just just hearing about the the amount of people that go to that thing, it's hard to get around. And, and expensive, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so there's a two two hour screening of a Leviathan documentary. Um, so the, the a screening of the two hour version of Leviathan at Leicester, uh, Sunday, October eleventh, from ten a.m. Right. to six p.m. What? I think in England they they pronounce this Leicester. It's, oh. it's, it's weird. I know, but it, they write it Leicester, but I think they pronounce it as Leicester. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, Comic Con Leicester twenty fifteen. They they will be showing that special two hour cut. I think it's uh, Dead Mouse Productions uh, that's doing a bunch of like screenings. So Robert, uh, Danny's, how can Danny's, it be ten a.m. to six p.m. if it's a two hour movie? I don't know. Uh, Look at that much. <laughs> maybe that's the uh, entire uh, the entire maybe, show of that yeah. day or something. You know, or maybe they'll have movie. yeah, or maybe they'll have a panel and everything. I yeah, don't know. yeah. I would definitely oh, go to right. their that, go to their website and you know you can figure out exactly when the screening is, but. Or they'll have two screenings Smart. back to back. I don't know. Yeah, I know Gary Smart and uh, some of the crew are going to be there. So now I'm sure our friend those. Danny will be there too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he'll be. All, they're offering some uh, limited editions of the of the documentary. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm but, curious to see this. If uh, supposedly they they might release the two hour cut on Blu-ray, so I'm I'm kind of curious to see how they would condense that all that into two hours. So. Yeah. Hmm, that's a good point. I, I'm still happy with the one we have. I oh mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, Eleven hours. I you know I just get couldn't get that. enough of the stuff. Yeah. Well, there's the uh, Clyde Barker Origins. There was more information that came out. Uh, Clyde Barker Origins: Salome and the Forbidden. So apparently, uh, the extras have been revealed to be uh, the same vintage interviews with Doug Bradley, Clyde Barker, and Peter Atkins, which I'm assuming are the same ones from. The original release, so I don't think there's any new stuff in there. But um, but yeah, oh, so yeah. Clyde Barker Origins, Salome and the Forbidden is getting this new um, release, which is already out. Uh, and if you haven't seen those, they're they're really strange experimental uh, <coughs> 16 millimeter and Super 8 uh, short films that were done by uh, people who were a part of uh, Clyde Barker's uh, dog company and. Um, some of his friends from high school. Which... It, it's nice to see that Seraphim has the rights to release this themselves, because uh, the the old version was Redemption Video, and they had like a half hour preview of <laughs> of vampire yeah, softcore, softcore porn, porn yeah. sort of. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know. And, uh, it was, it was yeah, funny. I, though. I don't think you could skip ahead either. Maybe you could. You had to watch it. I thought I thought you could. Yeah. Maybe you I can. You... I, I just saw it one time. Yeah, I think it came out first in VHS, and then there was a DVD. Yeah. And then it came out again in the uh, Anchor Bay Lament Configuration set. Oh, did it really? Hellraiser 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, it was one of the bonus features on oh. that. Okay. I wrote, I wrote that on my article. And then it it's now coming out again for the third time, so... And um, and speaking of Hellraiser box sets, so there's a um, the 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 Arrow uh, UK box set of Hellraiser one, two, and three. Uh, it's called the Scarlet Box, right? Yeah. And uh, and the the news here with that one is that Sean Chapman is going to be doing uh, an interview for one of the bonus features. Yeah. Yeah. That's so uh, cool. <laughs> they, didn't for, uh, they didn't get him for. They didn't get him for. 
the documentary, so Arrow somehow snagged him for the uh, uh, exclusive interview for the their uh, this box set. That's yeah, yeah that's pretty rare. That's kind of neat. Arrow Video said on their website, uh, on their Facebook page, he thought he'd gone to the limits. He hadn't. Sean Chapman, <laughs> Uncle Frank, poses with our very own architects of pleasure and pain, Mark Morris and Jake West of Nucleus Films, following an in-depth interview of his role in Hellraiser and Hellbound to be included in our upcoming trilogy release. So this, the, the news was posted by Gary Smart, and uh, we posted it on the blog. And like you guys, I've bought Hellraiser so many times, and, and I've never once seen a, a special feature with him. Yeah. I've seen Sean Chapman in some uh, British television shows over the years. Sometimes I'm, uh, I, was, I was, you know, zapping, and I would be like, oh, let's watch this, like, detective show on BBC. And, mm -hmm. and suddenly I was like, hey, that's, that's Uncle Frank. <laughs> and I saw Sean Chapman in an episode. It was this episode about a detective who has, like, a scar on his face. I don't know the name of it, but it's a British show. And I think, <clears throat> if I recall, the episode where he was in, there was actually some woman that I think was Julia. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, I'm getting flashbacks. Oh, <laughs> someone, someone killed someone and buried them in the backyard of the house. And I'm like, huh. That's, I wonder how much of this is like a reference to Hellraiser, especially the other woman being called Julia. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's looking a little older now, but he, you know, he still looks great. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm going to find a way to see to 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 see that um, that video set now. Oh yeah, the era one. Yeah. It's also going to have that little book from Phil and Sarah about Hellraiser. Yeah, and we heard something about the audio commentary that maybe we shouldn't say right now, but um, yeah, makes me want to see it also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, this next one, Jose, you you made this post about um, about Wes Craven passing away, and it was interesting because you found the old video of when uh, Wes Craven and Clive Barker were on Doctor Ruth, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I posted that uh, back in August 30 when we uh, heard the news that he had passed away from brain cancer at 76. And uh, I, I Googled up, you know, I, I know that Clyde Barker and Wes Craven knew each other and, and you know, were friends. So I, I Googled up uh, Wes Craven, Clyde Barker, and this YouTube video came up. And it was a YouTube video from the uh, Dr. Ruth show yeah. where, where she had both of them talking about horror and sexuality in, in cinema. So I decided to include that in. And um, apparently it was it was it was um, picked up by the LA Times, I think. Yeah. And they actually linked to our page as well when they were doing their own feature about the, the passing of Wes Craven and they, they said they did call us Clive Barker's official website, I think, but Yeah, they said Clive Barker's <laughs> website posted it and I'm like, yeah. Oh, we're not really Clive Barker's website. That's yeah. one Sarah Revelations. But um, so, yeah, and uh, it was very interesting. And also Clyde Barker later made a personal tribute statement on his official Facebook page where he said, from the first time we met, Wes was a friend, generous in his support of my work and wonderfully witty when talking about the deceits and nonsenses he faced as he fought for his unique cinematic vision. Wes was a gentle iconoclast, a man whose sudden absence from the world has left me sad beyond words, but grateful to have known him while he was still with us. So, um that, that was it. I mean, Wes Craven for me, and I think also for you, Rob, and you know Ryan. He certainly made some really iconic movies that have fueled our love for cinema. So it's a great loss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really am a big fan of. Uh, I recently got uh, "People Under the Stairs," the Screen Factory uh, new uh, oh, release yeah. they put out on Blu-ray, and it was. Uh, it's, I think that's a really good film. I really enjoy that one. It's a <clears throat> one of the better he, ones. I think it's underrated. Oh yeah, yeah. And also, he he also did movies that were not horror. I, I urge people uh, to go see Music of the Heart. It's oh yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah. He also did Red Eye. That wasn't a horror film, really either. Oh, I remember that about that uh, plane flight. Yeah, he did that one with the Jim Caviezel. No, it's not Jim Caviezel. It's the guy who played the, the Scarecrow. Scarecrow. From that's the right. Yeah. Batman films. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good movie too. But that's a but that's a huge loss, and you know, uh, uh, but we have all these other films to remember them by. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the Dark Inker uh, tackles the books of blood. Uh, 
It was the interview with uh, Stephen Sampson. He's the called the Dark Inker. And it was an interview conducted by Sci-Fi Now where he did a uh, a picture, a digital photo of uh, Simon McNeil from the Books of Blood. And it was really cool how it was, uh, you know, uh, it showed there was a video showing how he did it too. Oh, that's so, cool. uh, so go check that out uh, on the blog. There's a link to the video of how he uh, created that in the computer. It's kind of cool to see the Books of Blood getting more attention now, you know, with Made Fire app and stuff and, and this now. I, I, I hope that, that the Made Fire stuff continues. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I mean, do too. I, I haven't heard on anything on that in a long time. Yeah. I'm just uh, thinking that some of the stories will have to be uh, split in parts because some of the stories are really long, and to animate yeah. all the story that might take like a couple of episodes, especially stories that, um, yeah. like 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 Rawhead Rex that have a lot of action and stuff. So yeah, Rawhead Rex is huge. That's yeah, like, isn't that like the sixty-page short yeah. story? Yeah, that's so, get, hmm. getting close but to so a novella. He, but so the, the the Dark Inker, what he did was uh, he he reimagined some of the covers for the Books of Blood. Was that what he did? Yeah, I don't. That they they just showed uh, the picture of Simon McNeil, but uh, yeah, apparently so. Hmm. Cool. Cool. I didn't. Maybe we'll have to watch out for the rest of them and see if we can find them. Yeah. Sure. Maybe I yeah. can email. Maybe I can find him on Facebook and email him or something. He does some really good work. I'm looking at the link right now, and I'm seeing like a poster for Guardians of the Galaxy with Rocket Raccoon, and it yeah. seems like yeah, he works a lot with vector that. art and stuff like that. So that that's cool. Yeah, go check it out on the blog. It's it's uh, it's posted there. So check out our news. And some Clive Barker art's going to be shown at Necromancy, a dark art event, which is in uh, Orlando, Florida, October 24th, Saturday from eight to two. So that's cool. I want to know what art is going to be there. I mean, I'm assuming this is Century Guild related. Yeah, I hope they release it to where the to the public so we can see it. I'm always interested in seeing more new art. Yeah, oh, to see to see what they're what they're displaying. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Yeah, that would be cool. Roger, if you're listening, you should go to this. Yeah. I don't know how far Zephyr Hills is from Orlando, but uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Is pretty big. Um, so, Gods and Monsters is a comic book store, which has a nice, nice title because there's that movie, Gods and Monsters, also produced by Clyde Barker. Yeah. yeah. About James Wells. Now, this is some great news right here. I, can't, I don't know about, about you guys, but I'm really looking forward to this book. Paul Kane's uh, come with a, a new book that pits Sherlock Holmes against the world of Hellraiser. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, it's really interesting. It's called uh, a short story, I think. Is it just a short story, not a novel? Oh, I, th- I think it'll be a short story. Oh, yeah, because okay. he posted he posted an article about uh, Sherlock Holmes falling out of copyright. Uh, there's a certain gray area that that's being explored uh, explored about Sherlock Holmes not being in copyright anymore. So uh, some people are starting to come up with more his more stories about uh, Sherlock Holmes and his take on it is going to be with Pinhead because he got permission from Clive Barker to include Pinhead in his story. So that sounds interesting. Uh, It's called Sherlock Holmes and the Servants of Hell. Yeah. Well, and if anyone's uh, anyone's done a lot of research about Hellraiser, it's Paul Kane. Yeah. Absolutely. He did did that book, Hellraiser... Hellraiser films, and their, films and their legacy. And their legacy. Yeah, and there's yeah. a second book, right? But that, So that still hasn't been released? Or what do we know, know. about that one? It, it was going to be a book called Hellraisers. And uh, it's yeah. been announced, but then it, I, I think the oh. printer went out of business or something. And I actually I contacted Paul. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It, it was going to be a book uh, full of interviews with people like Nicholas Fence and Simon Bancourt and other people. But I think that book has been put in the back burner for a while. I'm not sure why. Maybe they're saving it for another time. But hmm. I need to ask Paul Kane about it, see what he has to say. Yeah, so Paul Kane, if you're listening, maybe you could uh, shed some light on that so for people that are interested. Uh-huh. I know, Jose, you even had pre-ordered it at one point, right? I had. I don't even know what's going on with that pre-order. My, I think I had like a pre-order number four or something like that. But oh, wow. uh, yeah, I need to look into that. That's a good point. I like the cover that, that – uh, I don't know if it's the official cover – 
but the mock-up cover they have right now was really cool. It's like Sherlock Holmes is like silhouettes and kind of like laid against the uh, limit configuration. Mm. Yeah, in red. So yeah. So it was um, published by Solaris Books in July of 2016. So here's hoping. Oh wow! Okay. That. Well, that that'll be interesting. And uh, speaking of Hellraiser related stuff, uh, Doug Bradley is going to be appearing at Chicago Days of the Dead um, convention uh, at the Marriott Hotel November 20th through 22nd. Uh, the Chicago Schaumburg Marriott Hotel. So that, there's another chance to get an autograph and a picture with Pinhead. So yeah. And get him to sign your Scarlet Gospels book. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is, isn't the the collector's edition of the Scarlet Gospels going to have like an intro by Doug Bradley or something? Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah, yeah, then, then in that case, I would do that. But I always feel weird when I see people in lines bringing stuff to people that they had nothing to do with. <laughs> well, in, in this case, arguably, I mean, he he's played Pinhead. So. He, he's got a lot of influence on the Scarlet yeah. Gospels, I think. I guess you could you could have him sign the the, the Pinhead. Uh, image in the back yeah. cover of the uh, American edition, or the front cover of the British edition. Yeah, but yeah, I saw because... you know I, I would cringe when I'd see people bringing like um, Hellraiser to Barbie Wilde to sign and. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, they didn't know that she was not the. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, send a bite. Yeah. There you go. Go if you're in uh, Chicago, go go check out Days of the Dead 2015, and you'll be able to meet Doug Bradley. Yeah. Uh, the Shadow Horse Theater is going to adapt the history of the devil in Minneapolis, oh. Minnesota. So uh, they're still uh, they're still figuring out a few things. I mean, they still have like an open casting call, I think. Um, but they they'll have a preview show that will run in November fifth. Doesn't David uh, Anderson live around there? He does live in Minnesota. I'm not sure where exactly though. So hopefully, David, you'd be able to check that out. That that would be pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there will be a preview show on November 5th. The opening of the show will take place on the 6th. And then, uh, you know, there will be 7, 8, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And they will also have something which I think is really interesting, a pay-what-you-can show that will last through the 16th, 19th, 20th, 21st, and the closing show will take place on Hmm. the 22nd of November of this year. That is really cool. Yeah, it is. And it's a great play. I mean, it's one of the best. History of the Devil, it's so, you know, such a huge, uh, complex it's play. really epic. And they've done, really they've epic. previously done Crazy Face, right? So they're not new to uh, Clive Barker plays. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we mentioned that. Yeah, so that's pretty neat. Um, I man, if <clears throat> if there was one even in Anchorage, which is like six hours away from me, I would go to it. Uh, any any production of any Clive Barker play? Yeah, I would. I'd, I'd do that if it came out. Something came out on the East Coast. Yeah, definitely. Try pushing the local theater companies. Yeah, they. they, they, they yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of around Asheville. There's a lot of people put on a lot of plays. So, you know, maybe I could you know do some talking about maybe yeah. somebody doing a Frankenstein Frankenstein love. Yeah, got to buy him a copy of uh, Incarnations. Incarnations, yeah pay a dollar to Clyde Barker and they can adapt it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this, I was trying to skip ahead before, uh, but Clive Barker Imaginer volume two, uh, they, I think they've, the, the, they're being shipped over to Century Guild right now. Yeah. So they're, they're printed and they're being shipped over to them and then they're going to put their orders together and send them out to us. I think by like November. Uh, October. October? October. Oh, we'll ship out in October. Okay. So, awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to getting that. That's right. So I can have one more slanty spine title on my my shelf. (laughs) You got a lot of those. (laughs) So, um, it's, again, limited to 1,000 copies. And um, if you are a member of the Kickstarter, you're in luck. So, there you go. Are they still selling them? I think they are. Yeah, it says here you can pre-order a copy of the book at the official Century Guild site. Yeah. Yeah, until they're gone. Yep. And they still have a few copies left of uh, of Imaginer, volume yeah. one. So if anybody's interested in that still. 
So Danny did a post on our website about uh, other screenings of that two-hour version of Leviathan um, going on around uh, around the UK uh, and and Europe, I guess too. So we have Northampton Comic Con, uh, Grimfest, Odeon Printworks. Uh, you said Leicester Comic Con, Athena, uh, Bristol Horror Con, Celluloid Screams Showroom Cinema. And weekend of hell in Germany, and all we don't well the, you can go to the website to we, you know we'll put a link in the show notes to so you can see all of the dates and everything. But they're all around October and November, mm-hmm. which is the perfect season for that, which yeah. is Halloween. <laughs> yeah, I was well, looking. Cool. At, I'd be uh, interested to see that two hour cut, but I kind of need a break <laughs> right now. Yeah. But I was just looking at uh, uh, Imagine One on eBay. And uh, I think I found some copies, and they're already over a hundred dollars. Oh, really? Yeah, hundred and eighty-nine. Well, I mean, if that's what we paid for it, isn't it? Yeah, but there's one copy, for example, that's going for a hundred and eighty-nine dollars right oh. now. Is that yeah. just the bid- bidding right now, or is that somebody just doing a sell it's it a, now kind of? It's a buy it now. Yeah, you know, buy it now. They, they they may never get that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so uh, the let's see what else. Oh, the short story. The, yeah, the, the short story new, title. Uh, or previously unreleased short story called Afraid. And that's going to be a part of that. Uh, is that horror horology? Lexington, Lexington of Fear, or something like that. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think they had put the the uh, out, the. Well, titles. it's a book edited by Stephen Jones work in other books like The Nightly Chronicles and The Hellraiser Chronicles, Clive Barker's A through Z of Horror, and uh, you know other books like that. He's editing this this book called Horrorology. It's going to be illustrated by Clive Barker. And Rob, you posted this. Yeah. Um, you posted this back in uh, a few days ago, like three days ago. Yeah, so, the 13th. Yeah, it's going to have stories from Clive Barker, Robert Shearman, Michael Marshall Smith, Pat Cadigan, Mark Samuels, Joanne Harris, Muriel Gray, Kim Newman, Ramsey Campbell, Reggie Oliver, Angela Slatter, and Lisa Tuttle. Interesting. Lisa Tuttle, she was also in that uh, uh, anthology with Clyde Barker. What was the name of that thing? I forgot. Well, I'll, I'll think about it later. But uh, So there's going to be a story, like you said, uh, with Clyde Barker, which is going to be called Afraid. And the book will be released on October 1st. And uh, it'll cost 25 pounds, Great Britain pounds. Uh, it's going to be hardback. You can also get it from Kindle for 12.99. Again, Great Britain pounds. It'll be released on October 1st. That's so just here in a few weeks. Okay. So horrorology. Uh, I just found the Kindle edition on Amazon Prime. Well, Amazon. I mean, I'm the Prime, but it doesn't mean. Anyway, it says here um, you can find it on Amazon. And it says it's going to be 400 pages, Kindle edition. And uh, Joe Fletcher books going to be released October 1st, 2015. Okay. So go to Joe Fletcher books, and you will find Horrorology, the Lexicon of Fear. I'm adding it to my wish list right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what through Amazon? Yeah. The wish list Amazon. you can make. Yeah. Cool. I will send the link to you guys so we can add this to the show notes. Yeah, and and um, it seems like these little things you got to get them right away. It's I missed out on. There was one recently that I missed out on, and and then there's that artist edition with the turn down the lights story, and and uh, that one is still not done because they had some kind of like all the autograph pages got lost in the mail, and they had oh, to start terrible. all over getting the autographs, and I still haven't gotten it. It's been over a year. I think I got oh. that one from Kindle. Um, I think oh. w- wasn't that one that had like a story from Clyde Barker in there? And, there uh, there's the one about um, there's like there's the one about was it? So there's turn down the lights, and then there was one of I can't remember now. Dolly. Dolly. Okay. Yeah, uh, or Dolly is in turn down the lights, and then now oh, I gosh. think that's the one I got uh, yeah. by Kindle. Yeah. Okay. It was okay. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm always excited about a new short story that oh, hasn't yeah, been published elsewhere. 
Um, Ann Bobby got a Best Actress Award at the Horror Hound Film Festival in Suffer the Little Children. And uh, I contributed a little bit to that one. I'm excited to see that movie when, you know, when it's available for us to, to look at. Um, it also won Best Short Film, too, so. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations to Bonfire Films and Ann Bobby, uh, Corey Norman. Uh, that's awesome. Yay. <laughs> It's based on a Stephen King story from his short story collection, Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Um, oh, Clive Barker the, the, is uh, on. Is he on the board of directors for the Hollywood Horror Museum? Yes, he is. Yeah. So he, uh, they started a Kickstarter, which I uh, which I contributed to. I bought the Wes Craven. They were offering all these kind of mo- all different kinds of like like model kits and uh, oh, really? movies, movies and. Oh, all did, kinds of stuff. Did Clive Barker put anything in there? Uh, no, I don't think so. None of his, like, you know, nothing, you know, related to him, no. It was just, like, like Screen Factory put some stuff up. I bought the, that a copy of a Shocker, Wes oh, Craven okay. Shocker, and I bought that. Oh, right. Is that the guy who gets executed in the electric chair and then he comes back? Yeah. Oh, and I love that it's, movie. It's, a, it's, it's crazy. He's just, you know, crazy. <laughs> Crazy top, top, nice. crazy film, but oh, I liked it. It's from I think it was a late '80s film. Uh-huh. I love those. I love those films from the '80s, and it's Wes Craven. And I just wanted to get that and help out for that. But uh, so I just pulled it up uh, right now. They've got 76 backers. They're at five thousand one hundred and thirty-one dollars out of twenty-one thousand six hundred goal, and they have twenty-five days to go. So still lots of time. Uh-huh. I'm kind of now since you since we're talking about this, I was kind of curious to see what the what kind of things there are to get. Well, it's always nice to be able to have another museum, <clears throat> especially one that celebrates Hollywood horror. Uh, I know, for example, was it Rick Ma- Rick Baker, uh, the makeup artist, the the, the, the world renowned Rick Baker? He's retiring, and so he wants to downsize his collection. And he was announcing that, you know, I I hope that these things go to you know good homes and good places but he was selling some of his work over the years and stuff like that i hope some of that makes it to this museum because yeah, yeah. it's a shame that sometimes um movies get done and things just get thrown into like uh you know a, a warehouse and are forgotten and it, it would be nice to have something that celebrates these movies because some of these movies are real cult classics and it's a shame that that things get destroyed and there's you know, a big like, trouble in Little China Blu-ray on here as one of the prizes. Yeah. So how do they do? How do they get away with that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> there's, <laughs> o- there's only one. Uh, I'm thinking of getting that one for thirteen dollars. Okay. So you're talking about the rewards, right? Because yeah, Kickstarter doesn't allow rewards uh, that are not made or produced by the actual people. Yeah. Doing the project on the Kickstarter. Which... Right. So this isn't a, mu- you know, a, a Blu-ray of an old movie is not made by the people who are doing the museum, presumably. Right. I guess they're donated by collaborators, which is a good way to uh, get around that issue. Yeah. Well, we have. <laughs> oh, we'll yeah. talk about that in a little bit. Anyway. Sure. So this is a more recent one. Uh, Crystal Van Etten, who's uh, on Facebook. She's Red Van Gool. Uh, they have a, a they've they're working with Clive Barker and they did a line of Cenobite sort of related makeup, uh-huh. and we've got show notes about that. Interesting interesting thing about this is that uh, I actually heard about this from our blog because my wife was visiting our blog and she told me, hey, this makeup is really cool, oh, and really? she showed me on the phone and I was like, holy moly, that's her blog, <laughs> and and so it went full circle and uh, <laughs> that's awesome, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I read about this, and I thought it was cool. I mean, there was already that uh, the perfume that was made by uh, that other company that worked with Century Guild to make perfumes yes, based on Clive right, right. stories. So you can and smell like Candyman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so pretty cool. So that there's going to be four colors ranging from Leviathan, Pain and Pleasure, Schism, and the Engineer. There's, some of these words are a little weird uh, when it comes to like describing. Uh, or naming cosmetic colors. Like schism <laughs> yeah. is not really like, it's like calling something abyss. I mean, it's not really, but anyway, uh, yeah. yeah. So if, if you want to, you know, put your makeup on like a Cenobite, go get the uh, espionage cosmetics line of Cenobite makeup. Cause sometimes we look at the number of people who have seen the posts on our 
Facebook page, and it's insane. Yeah. Like the other day, I saw a post was shared eleven, not shared, but it was seen by eleven thousand three hundred and eighty something people. And wow. usually, those are the posts that are shared by the Clive Barker page as well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we'll get into the Kickstarter. We'll save the Kickstarter update for last. But um, for site news, things that we're working on. Um, Rob, you did a, a review of the Nightbreed Director's Cut. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was nice. Now always, you know, it's nice revisiting that film. You know, it's going to be a year. Yeah. The year's coming up for, uh, the re- that was released, what, October 28th? Or like mm-hmm. 23rd, mm-hmm. something like that. So, um, yeah, I thought 2014. It was, you know, yeah, it's 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 cool, you know, and and we've talked. About, I think we've talked about this before, but Jose and I just, I think we were just too so close to it at the time that it just didn't even occur to us to try to look at it objectively. Yeah, I know, but still, ten out of ten, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I know. Yeah, uh, I think it's. Yeah. I thought about I thought about doing a review of the theatrical cut, theatrical cut with it, but I decided against it. Yeah, so I thought well, the and we, cut we, it in its own. We spent review. so much time talking about it on this podcast too. That, oh yeah, you know, it's like we you like know. an entire year. Yeah, yeah. So you know, well, and since 2012, you know, with Occupy Midian. Yeah, yeah. But I thought you know, I really enjoyed that version of the film, and every time I see that ending, you know, I can't help but get a little choked up. Yeah, when, uh, the yeah, last it, line, the it, last lines, you know, when they're in the barn. And it fades out to oh yeah, Boone and Lori, and then it fades out to that uh, where you yeah. hear the wind just kind of just yeah. take off, uh, take you off to like the the. It's actually it's cool. It goes to the back to the prophecy room. Yeah, uh-huh. that's right. When the the credits start rolling and you see the the prophecy room, uh, the prophecy wall with the yeah. planes in slow motion. That's that's really that's really neat. That, that really it, it makes it. Uh, gain this like um, it makes it gain this prophetic uh, kind of yeah that's, kind of you know is fulfilled exactly that, the uh, words are escaping me but it, it makes it seem like that place is now held in in fantasy forever it's like that place yeah, yeah. makes it yeah. more real to us it's and, like, and even some, though some people Midian has been destroyed you know yeah. you can still go back and visit it and and you know revisit it as many times as you want and some people really like the old ending with decker coming back and you know and it's like yes clive barker shot it for them because they asked him to and yeah i mean it's a really well shot it's a cool scene but i think that its place in the movie it doesn't really quite belong in the movie compared to this new ending well new old ending okay I, i i love the I love the new ending with with you know that's more that's closer to Cabal with with Lori um, trying to kill herself and I do miss having Narcisse be present at the ending though. Oh, even yeah. though I know that in Cabal he does yeah you know, and they die. and that was an add on cutaway shot so you don't ever even see him with the other Nightbreed He's, yeah yeah He's, that's one of the things that I do miss about the ending yeah. Of, uh, the director's cut is that Narcisse is not there. Yeah, well, and that's um, and we had talked to Hugh Ross about that, and it, it seems like he had made it made Narcisse such a cool character that the people at Morgan Creek didn't want to let him go. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Which he is, st- you know, he steals a lot of the scenes. Yeah, and I, you know, instead of looking at that as interference, you know, we can look at the positive side of it and say, like, yeah, he made such an awesome character that that he got to live. Exactly. Yeah. But another thing I was glad about, uh, you get to see uh, more of Kane, George Roth's character in the the Nightbreed director's cut. Yeah. Which became, you know, his character became more relevant. More, yeah, uh, more fleshed out. And, yeah. yeah. Kind yeah. of a weird, kind of a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> you can always trust your friendly garrot. <laughs> yeah, I know. He just kind of, doesn't he lick it? Doesn't he lick it? Yeah. yeah. Or something he like runs, that. Yeah, he runs it through his lips. It's yeah. like, no, you can keep that. I don't want it. <laughs> so, uh, there's the only line I really I was going to ask you. Do you miss the guy when uh, Boone lets out uh, the what's called the berserkers? Do you miss that line? Go get them, boys. Or do you feel like that? I do. I do. I know. Oh, yeah, I do too. I found. 
I think they took it off because maybe they thought it was a little cheesy, but I, it, it I is kind of corny. But it, I mean, I don't know. It's just become a part of the movie. It's hard. To... Yeah, I'll have to ask Philippe if he's intending on leaving that line in yeah. in his cut of the movie. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think it's so cheesy that it needed to come out, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, me either. It's still, it's still, you, it still can work. It still can fit. And it's Boone addressing the berserkers like they're. Part of the, people, you know, you know or part yeah. of the, 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 the night. The it's not like just some mindless things that he just release and run out of the way. Yeah. yeah. It's like, go get them, boys. Well, it's true. Yeah, I just... mean, he, they, hope, he, yeah, he, I mean, he's got to tell them what he has in mind. It's like, not like I'm opening the door so you can just wait here for me to jump down and kill me. Exactly. Yeah. It was just so, a way for me. I always got pumped up at that line, but. I was just curious if y'all what y'all thought about that. Yeah, well, and the music kind of swells to that point, you know, and 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 that sort of punctuates it. And it's one of those tracks that is actually not by Danny Elfman; it's by this uh, female composer. It's called "The March of the Berserkers," which uh, I don't think it's in the soundtrack at all. But uh, really, never found that. Yeah, never found that anywhere else. Huh? That's that's true. Yeah. No, oh, you I can look at. I didn't know that. Oh, and Rob, you did a you did a five best uh, Clive's five uh, the five best moments from the Scarlet Gospel. So those were your your five personal favorite. Hey, you guys know that I was looking at the the official Clive Barker page um, albums, and there was an album where they were posting pictures from uh, the manuscript of the Scarlet Gospels. Yeah, there's a, a picture of a page where Clive Barker was describing. Um, Lucifer's armor, uh, and Lucifer and what he's doing in the Scarlet Gospels. And I think that this is basically a spoiler, so I don't know if I should talk about this, but um, there's a written page. I'm trying to find it right now. So uh, in Clive Barker's page, there's a, a series of pictures of the Scarlet Gospels manuscript. And in one of those pages that they shared says, uh, from Clive's notebooks, detailing the creation of his forthcoming final tale of Pinhead the Hell Priest. And then it says, Lucifer devises a death machine made of his own bone. It fits over his head. He wants to experience the great human mystery, death, not fast, but slowly, agonizingly. And I'm trying to decipher Clyde Barker's uh, handwriting here, but it says, he deliberately does, um, and then I can't, I can't understand what it says here. He does uh, something that strips him of his angelic scales. They are everywhere around the throne, iridescent, exquisite, and in each a complete echo of morning star, the glow of heaven felt felt for a moment. Um, have we seen? Uh, I, I I'm just trying to uh, understand Clive Barker's handwriting. Sometimes it's hard, but it says. Yeah. But, uh, I'll, I'll I'll show you guys the picture, and you can uh, you can add this to the show notes. But I thought this was great because in the book, we don't really see Clive's, uh, uh, Lucifer's um, uh, scales? Better, sca- scales or something scattered, scattered all over the floor. So yeah. that was something that got changed. And uh, I just thought mm. that was interesting because one of the moments that you mentioned was, you know, Lucifer putting on his armor. Yeah. And uh, I just thought I'd bring up this, this issue about the wings and the scales that were supposed to be there. Sorry if I rambled a little bit. Oh, no, that's okay. I think my favorite scene is probably the fight with the unconsumed. Yeah, that is... Oh, sure. So it was another... I mean, there was a lot of highlights in that book. It's hard yeah. to pick, you know, the best parts, but uh, I just went through the, my notes, my notes that I'd made for the book and highlighted the parts that really, you know, I don't know, I got a kick out of. Mm-hmm. But that was, a, that, was, that was definitely a good, you know, throw down between the unconsumed and Pinhead. And you've made another Beyond the Limits, right? Yeah. Did one for uh, the painting, The Believer. Yeah. Which was a uh, kind of a depressing one. That depressed me after doing that. I, I don't know. I don't know. I was getting a, kind of a depressing mood after doing that one. But anyway, I, yeah, I'm planning, to doing, I'm planning on doing a few more of those. I have one uh, written up. I just haven't posted it yet. Oh, cool. Yeah, well, and those you really have to kind of see to understand them, but it's basically your interpretation of a Clive Barker painting. Yeah. 
That's and, all it is. And Jose, you did a um, you did a collector's corner about these uh, Nightbreed figurines. Oh yeah, Jim Braswell's uh, Jamie Jamie Braswell's uh, custom Nightbreed figurines, which of course you can read them. I posted them on the 31st of August, so go check out the blog. They're really nice looking custom made figurines that he used. Uh, he created using other figurines. Uh, normally that's how it goes. You get you get something that fits the body, then you get something that approximates like the head of the character you want, and then you just put them pull them together and put them back. Kind of like Agonistus in, uh, yeah. in Tortured Souls, right? So you kind of yeah. redesign these figures into another figure that's a completely new character. And he did a great job, and he's doing – he's working on five other uh, Night Breed figurines. So he, he promised to share more on Occupy Midian as he gets them done. So Ooh. I'm looking forward to that. Um. Oh, and uh, we had a Tuesday Tunes, the Nightbreed main title that, uh, Rob, I think you put that one up. Uh, yeah. Danny Stewart uh, did a review, uh, a short review of his um, screening of, Fright Fest screening of... The era videos, you know. Uh... 2K transfer of the Hellraiser movies. Yeah. Yeah. So he says it's really great. The sound and image are pretty awesome. So yeah. everybody's going to be crazy about it. I, I hope so. He says everybody should buy it. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, and, um, and and there was the last one, the, the the last Tuesday tunes. There was Dreams of Angelique from Hellraiser Bloodline. Oh yeah, yeah, right. By Daniel Licht, right? Yes, I think that's his name. That's one of the. It's a really good score. I enjoy that one. Mm-hmm. It's the opening of that uh, Hellraiser Bloodline score is a little. Uh, it, he mixes a little bit of orchestral, and at least in the opening, um, I have the CD. So yeah, uh, he, I think he used like a Russian orchestra for this one, and uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, he does his own take on it, and for a, for a uh, Alan Smithy movie, it's got a pretty nice score. <laughs> mm, yeah, I know. Uh, it's not just like some, you know, it's not just some uh, cheap score that someone did on a synth or anything like that. So I just thought I, was, I thought they it was nice to go back to a nice score where the third one kind of just rehashed some of Christopher Young's music with some new music by Randy Miller, and then most of it was, you know, uh, and a lot of rock metal music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's there's two soundtracks for Hellraiser three. There's the orchestral soundtrack, and there's and the. Rock soundtrack. Rock and roll. Yeah, the rock yes. and metal. I always wonder why they don't just put those together into a two-disc set instead of selling them separately. That'd be yeah, kind of cool. That'd be a nice yeah, little special edition. Nice little pack. Yeah. yeah. I guess they figure if someone... That way, if people don't like orchestral music, they can buy the, the rock one yeah. and vice versa. So, there you go. Um, I want to... I did... I, I, I want to say real quick... Uh, I did, had done a collector's corner with uh, Andrew Agu- Aguilar. He mm-hmm. did these things uh, called night weebies. And, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, those little, like those little crochet. Night, they're yeah. like little crochet uh, night breed dolls, and they're really cool. So <laughs> yeah, go look at those if you could. He's uh, really talented. Uh, really a lot of talent on the Occupy Midian yeah. boards. Yeah. So and we, we'll have a link there in the show notes so you can look at them too because it's hard to describe them on on in an audio podcast uh so rob you're working on some retro reviews uh coming up it looks like yeah i've got uh the book of blood i'm about done with that and then i'll do uh the midnight meat train and the candy man and then uh i'm gonna do uh try i've been i'm gonna do a different type of review with the beautiful darkness soundtrack review the score by Lido velasco i'm gonna try to been looking at some different. Uh, and for people that different... don't remember, that's the soundtrack for um, Levi- for Leviathan. I... Yeah, I think I'm the, the retro reviews that you're doing are for the movies. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The Blood movie, the Midnight Meat Train movie, and Candyman. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. I, I actually enjoyed the Book of Blood movie. Doug Bradley is in it in a brief cameo. Yeah. Simon Simon Bamford is too playing a moving guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. That, yeah. that. that is a cool, um, yeah, that is a good movie. Um, I think better than Dread, which they came out like, <laughs> I think it was, was it, uh, Book of Blood or no, it was, it was, um, 
Midnight Me Train, and then Dread, and then Book of Blood, right? Something yes. like that, yeah. Yeah, and I think that Dread was sort of the the crap sandwich. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. I know there's people out there who probably like it, but it's like I did, it just didn't work for me. But yeah, that's that's just how it goes. Yeah, and we've we've done an episode about it before, but um, yeah, gosh, Mad Mean Midnight Me Train is hard for me to watch. It's so unflinchingly Grizzly. violent. It is, man. There it is with the mahogany kills uh like Ted Raimi. Yeah. Oh yeah, or or drunk. they put you in the point of view of that poor woman when she's getting her head bashed off yeah. with a hammer. Yeah, that's uh And and like the first the, it, they do an ear ringing sound like she's become deaf and then and then her head comes off and it's rolling and you get from her perspective like the camera's rolling away. Yeah, that was Oh, yeah, just it's pretty harsh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's uh, that's what's meant to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean it's 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 done so well. It's just make for me. It's a little difficult to watch. Have you guys ever seen? I know this is this is getting into more graphic territory, but have you guys ever seen an animal being skinned? An animal? An actual? No. Yeah. No, I yeah. yeah. Because no. I've seen it. I mean, I look. You know, my par- my grandparents had a farm, so I've seen chickens. You know, getting their you know their head mm-hmm. cut off and getting plucked. I've been chased by a headless chicken when I was a kid. I'm sure that messed me up somehow. <laughs> yeah, my dad, my dad saw that when he was a kid. And he can't eat chicken. Mm. Yeah, I've seen rabbits being skinned, and the smell is weird. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when you know rabbits being killed and everything. I know in America people think of rabbits more like pets, but there's a lot of people who eat rabbit. Mm-hmm. So, oh yeah, there's people around around out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw pigs being killed, and you know. Pigs being killed traditionally in Portugal in the farm, like back in the 80s, early 80s. And uh, nowadays they do it with like a bolt to the to the brain. Yeah. But traditionally they stuck the pig with a knife and stab him in the heart. And that's yeah. how you kill the pig. And yeah. then you slash his throat and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm sorry if this is shocking any listeners, but that's – having that's seen that stuff, of- yeah, it, it's just – it hits me more when I see Midnight Meat Train, when I see the, the – the corpses, the human corpses being skinned and hung up mm-hmm. and bled into the bucket and all that. It yeah. just reminds me, transports me to that place in my memory where I saw animals being skinned and mm. stuff. It's just, it's cringing. It's, it's toe curling. Uh, yeah, for, yeah, for it is. Well, I, it, I told you, I had a, in my, I did a Beyond the Limits uh, picture. It was like a picture of a mahogany painting. And I had it when I was, a, when we were went to Atlanta back when I was a, a kid, there was a guy on uh, the train. It was a, you know, a, it was a underground Atlanta, Georgia, mm-hmm. on a on a on a subway where like this guy just kind of started yelling, "Jerry, please stop!" You know, just getting really belligerent, mm. and it was just bizarre. Right. Yeah. Okay. The sub, it was just really bizarre. So you got a flashback from the Midnight Me Train painting. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy! Anyway, so looking forward to those reviews, yeah. and uh, I'm still I'm still finishing my um, essay about the Scarlet Gospels, which keeps growing and growing. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I like that. Looking forward to that. Yeah, I thought I I lost that file because I was trying to find. I know that's what you had said. I'm glad you found it. Yeah, I, I thought I'd saved it in my desktop, and then I was like, I can't find that. So I ended up discovering it in the USB flash drive. Yay. So I still have those eight pages of stuff that I'm writing. Wow. And I'm, I'm, I, it's going to be a story about how the Scarlet Gospel started out from being a compilation of stories from other, you know, like like the story of Fraid or the story Dolly or whatever, stories that had been posted in other books. Originally, the Scarlet Gospels was going to be not just a collection of erotic photography and poetry, but also Clive was going to incorporate a lot of uh, assorted stories that had been published over the years into the same book. So yeah. at one point, the Scarlet Gospels was going to actually look like different books inside the same book. They even thought about having different typography or different paper for different sections of the book. So that was going to be really strange. Yeah. And ultimately, there, there was this huge trend metamorphosis of this book when uh the the clyde barker uh pinhead dumb story kind of started growing and 
you know, taking over the Scarlet Gospels title until the, the moment where he said, well, it's going to be black as the devil's rainbow, and then we're going to have the Scarlet Gospels. Yeah. And um, and then Alex sort of changed black as the devil's rainbow into a collection of poetry, which presumably never got finished. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, Alex is history, so I'm not uh, I'm not considering anything of what he was announcing as going anywhere. But um, but I hope so, the book yeah. of short stories come idea comes back. I hope so too, because I would love to be able to read some of those stories that I never had a chance to to yeah. buy, like uh, Pigeon and Teresa and stuff like that. Yeah. But so yeah, I'm I'm trying to fi- finish that, and there's all these interviews from Revelations that I've been scouring for information. What Clive was saying, oh, I have 300,000 words written for, you know, uh, stories like uh, Grail, which is going to be a story where Joseph of Arimathea was going to be present at the crucifixion. And we're going to see uh, the crucifixion of Jesus through the eyes of a dog and stuff like that. And it's like all this stuff that Clive has talked over the years that was going to be in the Scarlet Gospels. And then somehow this just became a manuscript on a shelf. Yeah. Who knows when this is going to come out? Or and like people, happens and people only know bits and pieces of all of that. So then they read the Scarlet Gospels, and there's been some some like some disappointment from some people. You know, why isn't it like this? Yeah, yeah. They were talking about the creation tree or something yeah. that the type of mention was going to be in there. Like Jesus and Lucifer were going to be in there. Yeah, I but, remember reading that interview where he said, uh, you know, Jesus is going to be in there. Once Clive was talking about, uh, after he saw Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, he was talking on Twitter about that, how he was going to make a, a story called Grail that was going to be about the, the history of Jesus, but not like what the Bible says. And so I'm wondering, well, what happened to these things? And, yeah. and of course, we're limited by the only, you know, our only source of knowledge is stuff that Clive said on Revelation. So that's what I'm trying to collate all those ingredients yeah. in and try to figure out well and he just you know, doesn't have enough time to develop all of this stuff right exactly yeah. and it's really focusing on abrac right now so. yeah yeah but but, uh, yeah. but it'll be really interesting and hopefully help people put it all into perspective when they're uh when they have their own expectations you know for scarlet gospels and then they read it and it's not what they were you know not what they were thinking it was going to be oh yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, so that'll be yeah. cool when that comes out Okay, I'll do my best to finish it as fast as I can. Uh, the last oh. thing, um, this is just a quick update about our Kickstarter because we've talked about that in the past. Uh, we've got everything just about ready, and the only issue is I'm, you know, we're like we just mentioned earlier in the podcast. Um, we are having an issue with the prizes, uh, rewards. I mean, the rewards they're not prizes, uh, just because Kickstarter says that they can't be things that are. Um, made by other people they're supposed to be things that you make yourself uh of course now we're looking at this this horror museum kickstarter and it's got all these donations of movies and stuff that you know the horror museum people didn't make but um you know i don't know if i could use that as an example i've got a a, an open ticket in with them just to make sure that what we're doing is going to be okay and then once they give us the green light then we'll um we'll we'll get it started and get it announced and everything I think we should yeah. be okay because, you know, it's not a lie to say that Clyde Barker sent us signed paperbacks. And so yeah. Seraphin, or at least Century Guild and Seraphin, are collaborators with us on this. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's coming straight from Clyde Barker, straight from the man. Yeah. So that that shouldn't be a problem in terms of uh, rewards. But it, yeah. we're, we're still working on those that aspect of the Kickstarter. And once we have everything together, you know, you'll be the first to hear about it. Yeah. They're going to be telling us to shut up with the Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, with the Kickstarter. We're excited about it. It's just it's taken a lot of work. Uh, Jose's done a ton of graphical and oh, video yeah. work on it. And, Excellent and, work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once we, we've got almost everything ready to go, it's just we're just waiting for well, this one little piece to fall in place and then we'll have it. Oh, man, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Yeah. So you guys will be able to support us for another year. And I promise you, we have some good stuff in store for you. Yeah. You watch these horrible movies, though. <laughs> uh, oh man, I, I've never seen Candyman three. I've never seen it. So I tried to. I tried to watch it. Well, we I did. Gotta... A, we did a whole episode about Candyman two and three. What? Ha- I don't remember what happened there. Did you just sort of fake your way through that? 
Candyman three? Did I say that I saw it? I don't I might remember. Have seen, like, I don't trailer. remember what you said. Maybe you did. Maybe you said you didn't see it. Maybe I said I didn't see it. I'm pretty sure I probably said I didn't see it. If I said I did, then I might have. Just I mean, I think you the... probably knew a lot of facts about the movie, and maybe we sort of went at it from that angle. Yeah, I think that's what I did because yeah. I haven't seen Candyman three. Oh, okay, yet. well, <laughs> you're you're in luck. Wait. It's it's the one with the Playboy uh, yeah. bunny, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've seen yeah. that movie. Yeah, ex- no. Exactly. No, I haven't seen that movie. So no, I might have just married. talked about how bad it was or how bad it sounded. Well, you'll get you might get your chance now. Um, that's one of I our stretch we, goals. And I remember we talked about the possibility of a Candyman four that was floating around the internet as well. Yeah. Yeah, you remember that. So okay. Yeah, we we were thinking about some of the stretch goals will be um, commentary Audio. tracks for bad movies. Yeah, so keep keep you guys posted on that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think we've kind of come to the end here. Um. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. It's always a pleasure. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to okay. you later. Bye. 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 The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This podcast and site are a labor of love by the fans for the fans. News, features, and show notes for this episode can be found at www.clivebarkercast.com. Uh, Go to iTunes and please leave us a review. Reviews really help us get the word out about Clive Barker. You can also find us on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twist, Blackberry, and Pocket Cast. Uh, We have a Facebook page, so come on and and, uh, like our Facebook page and and, uh, join the Occupy Media Group for lots of discussion about Nightbreed and other Clive Barker stuff. On Twitter, we're at BarkerCast and at Occupy Midian. Opening theme by Mark Buckle.